Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Devanshi and I am your host for the session today. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome. Today's session is a very special session presented by Mr. Suresh Prabhu, who was the who was a former Union Minister for Commerce and Industry. Mr. Prabhu is presently the Prime Minister's official emissary to G7 and G20 summits, where he has shaped the official agenda of the government of India on key issues and extensively engaged with global leaders and thinkers. Mr. Prabhu, though his significant, through his significant political and administrative experience, where he has several cabinet post, uh, held several cabinet portfolios, has scripted various reforms and organization transformations. Known for his out-of-the-box thinking, Mr. Prabhu's perspectives would be invaluable in these boggling times where we seek answers to unprecedented challenges. We also have Mr. Nishit Desai, founder of our research and strategy driven international law firm, Nishit Desai Associates. Mr. Desai is passionate about supporting social good and under his guidance, NDA has remained at the forefront in social sector in India. Please note that this session will be in listen only mode and will last for about 60 minutes of which first 30 to 40 minutes will be spent on panel discussion. The remaining time will be available for question and answers. We request all participants to post their questions in the chat. The moderator will queue up the questions for the speakers according. I request all members to keep writing the question while the panel discussion is on. Should you chat option? No. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much everyone around the world and a good afternoon to people in India. Good evening to the Eastern Hemisphere audience uh, and good morning to Western and uh, everybody around. First of all, our hearts go out uh, uh, to those who are trapped in the pen, uh, uh, you know, this pandem pandemic and um, in the COVID. Uh, it's a very sad thing, and it has created huge crisis around the world. And uh, while we saw that the crises are there, we began to think that just talking about crisis is not enough. I think it's important that we should do something about it. And uh, we thought that we can add one cent value if we ac actually have some kind of education interaction with um, with the clients and with the uh, public around the world, we may be able to find some solutions. So we decided to launch the CSEP program. Uh, it's kind of educational program, but with an intent to identify some solutions. So in last about three weeks, we have done about 50 odd uh, programs, educational programs. And what we are trying to do is not only talk about COVID-19, but also take them into segments and sub segments and sub segments or sub sub segments and see how each of this issue can be addressed. So it is just not about talking, it's about doing something. And if we can find solutions, for example, to start with first problem of COVID was how would business people or the community will deal with the contracts? There are, you know, theories of force measure and how does it apply if you don't or if you cannot fulfill your contract, what happens to you? Then we looked at, uh, uh, you know, uh, drones, how we can use drones, how can we use um, the uh, telecom, telemedicine act, we discussed about uh, IOT, we discussed about, uh, you know, uh, the use of now 3D printing in the next week we are doing. 
today, incidentally, we are also doing a program on how to set up my platforms to deliver grants and micro credits to those who are impacted by COVID. There are new structures, new solutions to the whole thing. We also looked at how AR, VR could help people develop their skill set and so on and so forth. So one of the major issues that we find uh, or we feel that will come up post COVID or during the COVID is the employment issue. And we have you know, focused a lot on manufacturing and other kind of thing. And we thought that it would take some time by the time uh, we get into the manufacturing, but in the immediate run, the, the opportunities and there, there exist a lot of opportunities in the services sector. And we thought it would be nice to interact with uh, uh, Mr. Prabhu about, uh, uh, you know, how, what are the areas? What can we do in services sector? How can we work together? Because services sector, first of all, um, is the strength of uh, India. Um, we have always excelled on services, whether it is airline or hotel or, um, you know, software or anything else you pick up by and large. It's in, ingrained in our culture. The services ingrained in the culture. And number two, that to set up a service business is um, is very quick, very fast, low capital, high value addition, low gestation period, and uh, you know you don't need too much of space. And again, the training is also very quick. If it's a manufacturing, for example, to learn lathe machine, you have to go on the lathe machine, and those will happen. I'm not uh, doubting that uh, for a moment. But idea is today, let us focus on services sector and how can service sector create a lot of employment to just give you one example in the last five years the maximum employment uh, was generated i'm told in the delivery boys i believe in the next five years it will be drones that will also create largest employment because unmanned drones are not permitted every drone will require two people there are many things that we can find out internationally when we travel many of you must have seen there are shops which only do nails for example not even haircut or nail but nail polish and nail stuff, the shops. So, you know, once we begin to think at a little detail or at a mic with a Microsoft, we'll find so many services that we can, you know, identify whether uh, med uh, uh, medical, paramedics, whether education, whether it is nurses, whether it is, you know, tourism. So we thought that let us focus on that area. So in the immediate run, we can address some of the employment issues and what are the things that we can do together and maybe it would be wonderful to have um, uh, uh, Suresh Prabhuji's uh, you know, uh, thoughts around that. And he has handled cross-border negotiations, the G20 and many other forums around the world, including I'm sure he's fully aware of the cross-border professional services. And so he can share his experience. And um, I think who better than Mr. Prabhu, you know? And uh, one thing I must talk about uh, Mr. Prabhu uh, on a separate personal note, he is so humble and so uh, with so much humility. You know, sometimes I remember, you know, the, the film actor like Amol Palak, he looks so ordinary, so nice, but he does extraordinary job and talented person, I think. You know, uh, so he is in his own way, hero for many of us. And uh, uh, it's so wonderful to deal with him, uh, you know. And um, I just want to really welcome him to this uh, discussion. We have. Um, large number of people, I think over 300 and some odd people have already been on this uh, platform. And um, uh, world has become a theater as uh, Shakespeare once said. So we have a uh, uh, wonderful audience. Let us together think, ideate, find some solutions and do something about this whole uh, crisis that has come in. And uh, uh, tough people uh, last, but tough times don't. That's been traditional saying. And I'm sure that we, if we think right way, strategize, uh, we'll find a lot of solutions to the current, um, you know, situation. So, may I request uh, Suresh Prabhuji to uh, give your uh, uh, exposition and uh, we have about 20 minutes to go and then we'll have some question answers. Uh, so, you know, and maybe you can take a few more minutes, no problem, but uh, it'll be nice to have this uh, session um, with you. Thank you so much. Suresh, over to you. Okay. So, really, thank my friend, Nishit Desai, for giving me this opportunity. And thank all of you for joining in. I think this is a 
we're talking about employment i'll come to it but probably one new employment opportunity has arisen is probably for those who will be doing this type of video conferencing it will be a new job opportunity because will not be going there so we'll be finding the opportunity uh, you know this is a very interesting topic and i think uh, if you permit me i will just not speak about the current one but just look at the historical perspective and what the future holds for us one is uh, if you really look at it ever since we have been living on this planet as human beings uh, initial many thousands of years we were living as hunters gatherers foragers so therefore we were all self employed we were doing everything that needed to be done by ourselves if you look at it there's no concept of employment but everybody are living to make sure that he takes care of his own livelihood and that depended that but that depended on many things your ability to work your hard work that you want to put in if you want to gather more you could go out and gather more if you want to hunt more you could hunt more there was a plenty of prey available anyway so this was actually left to individual ability there was no concept of storage in a sense there was nothing like i want to create more um, i want to hunt more so that i can save it for the next generation there was no concept of that because there was something which probably wanted to keep it for the next day next few days that's all because it couldn't even last then of course uh, we shifted from there and as people say it is great book of sapiens a very very remarkable statement on that is that fire changed the whole thing when the fire was discovered that changed the entire approach towards life because then you could cook you could do so many things and even then i would not go into all that part of it but initially in our existence on this planet no concept of employment we were all living for livelihood and we were doing that not going to much of detail but when agriculture started then probably you needed not necessarily employment but you needed partnerships because you as alone you cannot do many things so there was when the agriculture was developed agriculture was invented discovered or invented rather you could then think about how do you do agriculture in the most efficient way then we realized that probably if we join hands we can do much better so though we always attribute commune farming to communism probably commune farming started even those days when people realized that if you work together then we can do better things together but even then that's also far cry basic change probably is few years few decades a few centuries before industrial revolution and what happened subsequently industrial revolution few centuries before industrial revolution after the post agriculture phase people had enough food to eat they didn't have to go out and start hunting that much they of course were hunting but they could start store food that means they became from nomadic they settled down after they settled down they had more time so they had more food to eat so they didn't have to spend all the time going and finding out uh, animals to hunt so then they started probably is to manifest their inner thinking inner feeling and then we develop the artisans the craftsmen and therefore the economy previous to industrial revolution post agriculture revolution was also sometime to deal with the artisans that's how the different kind of new developed art and culture was used by here and then was also exported into different parts of the world but that was also a source of livelihood which became like that 
post industrial evolution something very dramatically happened we discovered machines of the type that needed to be worked and we had to we could do mass production mass production needed more people so the concept of the employment per se evolved in a very significant way post that phase and we had therefore to take care of machines we needed men and then men created machines and machine needed men and therefore that relationship developed and we had a lot of people after that being employed in that sense of the term whenever we had a activity like this it's not that before industrial revolution there was no employment there was but the concept of employment of the nature of employment changed dramatically this is very interesting thing when the railways came and they came to uk the horse men horse cart drivers they were thinking that going to be unemployed because now the railway comes so what happens to us we are the only ones the carriage operators which were taking people from one place to another now this is going to happen so we are finished what happened was interestingly that the fear was ill founded as was proved subsequently the railways created more jobs than the job that were lost so the displacement happened but the replacement was far bigger and therefore we never realized and we never worried about what happened at that particular time but it really benefited immensely now post that phase in the last several say at least few, few hundred years we are now seeing that the economies of the world has undergone a sea change and you mentioned nishit by very correctly is the concept of services has become more important in united states the largest economy of the world steel workers a powerful lot of organized labor in fact there was a time when the workers will decide the nominee for the democratic party and even in the uk actually the labor party even has a constitution wherein the unions have a say to choose the leader of the labor party who will become then prime minister or the leader of opposition but the unions became strong because there are many many laborers and in united states the steel workers very strong body the automobile workers were very strong because you need a steel for automobiles also so both industries were very powerful and as you know the united states has more cars than any other country in the world till china is trying to overtake them or already overtaken them but steel workers had a fixed job blue collar workers as they called the workers working in the shop floor had a fixed job fixed pay they will get the pay at the end of the month and because they are unionized they'll get home holidays they'll get pension they will get whatever was decided between the employer and the employees but they had a fixed tenure fixed job then came a phase when the service industry as nishit bhai mentioned wherein the service sector employees were not in the same category they were working not necessarily on some contract which was unionized for them this was not a contract the terms were not decided by collective body of individuals they were hired by shops small shops or others and they had to decide and bargain with them of course there was a concept of minimum wage so they had to be paid up at least that much but beyond that and then working hours probably were decided by the law of the land and therefore that regulated it but generally it was a not a unionized kind of workers that were deciding collective bargaining was not there and therefore this was the case very interestingly this kind of jobs were hourly jobs if you work for a few hours we'll get so much we'll get the pay as was decided between the employer and the employee interestingly these jobs were called as mag jobs because typically this kind of jobs started with mcdonalds wherein hourly payments was made somebody wants to do even evening few hours it was possible the students could go 
out of the campus and do these jobs and go back to the university the following day and come back again. So these kind of jobs are called mag jobs, which are overly jobs. Now, if you look at it, for the, the type of jobs people get and the employment has changed over a period of time. Coming to India, in India today, employment is a big issue. Obviously, country of 1.3 billion people, employment is a big issue. China is a big issue because same number of people, little more, but almost the same profile of jobs. If a China address that issue by getting into labor intensive, low cost manufacturing after say about 35 years ago. After 78 when they started, first Shenzhen special economic zone was created. Then all around the coastal areas they created this. Large number of people migrated and they said that this was a bigger long march than what Mao started in 19, before 1949. And large number of people migrated thanks to Deng Xiaoping, that they migrated from interiors of China into the coastal areas in search of these manufactured jobs, which are low cost manufacturing, high labor intensive manufacturing. So it could absorb large number of jobs. In case of India, we are going to, we have been facing this issue for some time now, that the India jobs, or I will call it employment, and I think we need to, at this point of time, necessary to decide why you need employment. Employment for livelihood. You want jobs so that you can earn money, run your household. Some people are lucky, like in the US, some people get in millions of dollars. So they don't have the livelihood issue. But for you and me, the job is necessary for livelihood. To take run of families, save something for the rainy days, so something for the future, particularly when we are not going to work, therefore you need that money, like old age, Nishit Bhai doesn't have that problem, but I have that problem. And therefore, situation like that is necessary. So job employment is for livelihood, essentially. Now in India, the large number of the livelihood providing employment opportunities comes from agriculture. Most people are doing earning their livelihood from agriculture. In India, though agriculture is less than 20% of GDP, it, agriculture, when we say agriculture, it includes horticulture, it includes fisheries, it includes um, dairying and all other things. All of this is more than 60% for the people who are dependent on agriculture and they earn their livelihood out of it. That includes farm labors, that includes those who are doing family farming and all of that. So the entire family works on the field, husband, wife, kids, and they earn their livelihood. The other segment of employment opportunity in India, which is manufacturing. Incidentally, manufacturing is only 16% of India's GDP. But it provides those blue collar jobs which people always want to get into because that gives you a better regular family income. Then again, because of union and support from labor laws, you can get something for sure. Then the third segment is one is agriculture, I said, most of it, industry. The third segment is services. Services are more than 60% of India's GDP. Very interestingly, agriculture offers 60% of livelihood opportunities, but less than or about 17%, 14%, 15% the GDP. Whereas services, which is 60% of GDP, more than 60%, but opportunity, job opportunities are less, more than obviously the industry, but far less than agriculture. Future, we'll have an interesting scenario. The jobs will be more in the service sector, as Nitish Nishitbek pointed out, 
an industry which is 16% of GDP today, and I had prepared a strategy of taking India's industry to one trillion dollar, which will be from taking from 16% to 20% of the GDP, and then not necessarily will be able to add 25% more job because 16% to 25% you add 25% more does not necessarily mean we'll have that much job because the automation new technology will be so high that the job opportunities may not be as high as we would like it to be in case of manufacturing so manufacturing or industry will will have to work towards increasing the gdp share of manufacturing and industry to gdp but not necessarily it will add jobs commensurate with the number that will be adding to the gdp because as i said for technology agriculture is people are dependent on agriculture and doing this there is a national sample and statistical organization survey it said most at least half of the people in agriculture they want to leave agriculture why because first uncertainty whether is of nature not necessarily the social status that employee working in a industry or service sector will get and not necessarily the kind of hard work that agriculture has to do because for morning till evening you're working on the field the field and in difficult at temperatures you work so people want to do that so services seems to be the only way it can absorb people who want to leave agriculture as I said, industry will not be able to absorb so many. The only sector, therefore, that can be absorbed is in services. Interestingly, services has already done that in the past. You look at job opportunities, particularly when you became independent. The only job was employment, was government. Then became private sector, which grew quite a bit, particularly after 1991. And so there were only two main opportunities. Either you go to government or private sector. Very interestingly, the government was providing jobs for, say, police. So the police may not have been recruited in the same number as were recruited in the past, but there were security guards were recruited in the private sector. What government did not do in the security space, the private sector filled in. The government may not have employed more people in the post as they were doing in the past. But as Nitish Bhai said, courier boys came in, the courier industry developed. The only one Doordarshan was there as mass media, as television channel. They didn't employ that many. But so many new new channels came up. India has probably more than 300 plus new channels, maybe say 800 total TV channels. So that means they employed more. So what is important is that jobs and employment opportunity were created somewhere else. There's no concept was a delivery boy, so called. There's nothing because, and I'm much older. So therefore, I can tell you, if I told my grandmother that I'm going to go and eat outside, she'll be extremely angry with me. So what do you mean? You don't have a house? Do you mean I, me or your mother cannot cook food for you? Why should you go out to eat? But today, if I tell my son that the only, way, only place that you can eat food is your own house, he'll start laughing at me. And now he doesn't have to even go out to eat, to a restaurant. He can get whatever he wants to get from any of the restaurant that he likes. will be delivered to him at home. And that's how the delivery boys came up. So the life style of the people has changed. Lifestyle has changed. The lifestyle change has created new opportunities. Like we could never imagine that I will sit at home and I can get anything that I want. I don't have to even go outside. Like, for example, if there was a conference to be organized like this 20 years ago, the only way we could do is that we have to go to Nishidbai's office or Nishidbai, wherever he has organized, 
that's the only way you could attend a conference. Today we don't have even step out of the house to talk to each other. So lifestyle has changed. In future, you will see the lifestyle change is going to offer many opportunities. And those opportunities will come in many, many areas. One could not imagine that entertainment and media industry can offer so many jobs. You could never imagine. And they are not only they are well paid, if not all, many of them, and they are a glamour is attached to them. Because my wife, who is a journalist for 35, 40 years, when she used to write, at best she'll get a byline in a newspaper. She used to work for Times of India, she used to do all investigative stories. But only thing that she will be identified with is a byline that Uma Kedi Prabhu has written this story. But today you can see the face of the person who is giving you news. So glamour is attached to it. So type of lifestyle change, where now you want to get more news, you want to understand more, then you want to entertain, get yourself entertained better. So entertainment industry has grown. In fact, in most of the developed world, entertainment industry offers many, many jobs, millions. Directly, those who entertain the back backstage, those who actually relate, many, many, millions of jobs. So this is something which has happened because of lifestyle change. People have money, so they want to spend on it. They want to get into it. Other, so in future, you will see that people will now be, new opportunities will be developed in many areas in the service sector, not so much in agriculture, not so much in industry, but in service sector. Of course, services cannot grow independent of either industry or agriculture. So, for example, when you want to transport food, to your house from the field. So field to market, the link which is necessary will happen through what? Through transportation. What is transportation? The service sector. When you want to make some product in shop floor, you need raw material to be transported there. What is that raw material? Transportation, that is also service. Because you are doing so many things, you need more insurance. What is insurance? It is the service sector. But insurance, what are you insuring? There has to be an underlying asset, underlying activity that you are insuring. So therefore, service sector will keep growing, but cannot grow independent of either industry or agriculture. So they have to also have a strong, robust growth for service sector to grow. But in future, you will see many opportunities, like this artificial intelligence, blockchain technologies, internet of things, big data. All of this will also offer job opportunities. They will create more opportunities, not necessarily in the same proportion in which the displacement took place. I give an example of railways and the horse cart toss. There was a different that the horse cart drivers lost jobs, but they were fewer in number than the people who benefited from the railways. I don't know right now whether that would happen, but the innovations will happen. The derivative products from these technologies will create more jobs. For example, artificial intelligence itself may not create jobs because artificial intelligence, again, is not an independent activity. It has to be applied somewhere. If it is applied on Medicare, then Medicare will create more jobs. So therefore, you'll see more jobs coming into India in the service sector as we go along. Now, we have to understand service sector jobs are not necessarily should be confined only to India's context. Japan, Korea, Europe are aging populations. The people there will need care at old age. We as Indians, young population, trained population, probably more inclined towards helping others, that's a part of our ethos. We can actually help and offer that service to the people in a more efficient manner. So service sector jobs will not necessarily be only confined to this. I will give an example. My wife runs an NGO called Mano Southern Vikas Sansa, where she has trained more than one, and, one lakh people, 100,000. Now she is working on training people for to be employed. She also runs a nursing college separately. So she is now trying to train people for to be employed as nurses and other 
so we says for overseas market so just imagine the opportunity this is a completely ngo so she's not doing anything for profit but for motivation she's doing that this kind of jobs will be created will be opportunity will be available i'll give an example how do you identify them now the question will be these are the macro level how do you do it on the grassroots level as a commerce industry minister i started a program called district led growth i appointed national council for applied economic research and indian institute of management to take six districts one in the east which is muzaffarpur in bihar second in north varanasi in uttar pradesh in south visakhapatnam in andhra pradesh in maharashtra west in sindhudurg ratnagiri the idea is let us study the district and find out how can this each district grow at 3 to 4% more than what it is normally growing the reason is if you can go at 3 or 4% more obviously all districts go 3 or 4% more than the normal growth india will be growing at 3 or 4% more because all the 620 districts of india together makes india gdp if, when we started doing this you will not believe it it is already a lot of work were done till i was a minister you'll be very surprised the revolution was so enormous that there are so many jobs in each of the service sector small manufacturing small agriculture which are not even thought of the advantage is the jobs will be locally created locally serviced so people don't have even leave the place so just imagine the new world and this has started even before the covid started so the idea was can we make locally driven growth possible so this is a great opportunity so this is something which we should do it all india basis study each and every district find out what is necessity in the district what are the natural resources available in the district what are the local talent available in the district what kind of training we need to give to them and as i said i have the personal experience because we are through our ngo we are trained more than 1 lakh people for self employment so this is something which can actually change the entire atmosphere why the jobs and employment is a two different thing the second aspect and that is again unique to india a prime minister started skill india program skill india offers the opportunity that because startup india is something which will create new jobs why you need job as i said to begin with because you want to be earning livelihood earlier you have to go and be employed but today by through startup you can be self employed and can employ more people this is going to be a new dimension so not necessarily employment would be the kind of employment that we had in the past but a new change the, the paradigm shift will create more job opportunities for the people and that can be a great game changer this can happen more of course now all of this we have to now think in different perspective because of the new changes that are going to happen as a result of this covid globalization and its new meaning will have to be understood as we go along we it difficult to say today how will it evolve but it has to evolve secondly the type of sectors that we are thinking will create job i was aviation minister and i was thinking that we could create half a million jobs in aviation we'll add more now the aviation is in trouble they will lose something like 250 billion dollars globally as lost revenues but that type of sector we have to take into consideration and therefore you will see that service sector and i agree with nishit bhai completely will be a new employment and job creator but as i said again i repeat that point that jobs employment will change its perspective its nature its characteristic in the years to come it has already changed but it will even change more as we go along that doesn't mean we have to worry because i gave an example how we started as a human race we are doing something different and over a long period of time millions of years at least few at least a million years we have changed ourselves so much so this is not to worry that what is going to happen after covid it is going to be different that's why un fear of unknown but i am very sure that we can tide over it and we can win from it if we strategize it we cannot win for it just by wishing that we, i should win you have to work hard and make it plan strategize put all our efforts into play 
But I think that can really help us to not only get over it, but probably help us to win from it. So let us work on that. I'm very happy that uh, we are discussing the issue. I think in some future sessions, I'd like to even give partic particularly the perspective about each sector, how it can really grow. But anyway, I really appreciate this. I will stop here so that we can have at least 10, 15 minutes for question answer. So this is by, if you permit me, I'll stop here. Uh, once again, thank you for this. Thank you very much, Suresh. I think we'll extend our session by 15, 20 minutes. Hope you don't mind. I think there are a lot of people and it would be very useful to take it to its logical end so that we have some action in front of us. So first of all, I fully agree with you that I think the nature of employment will change. And uh, many times I think whether employment is necessary or is, is it an activity that is necessary? We have to keep people occupied in a productive way. And that is one of the things. Now, one uh, action point that perhaps we can look at is um, can we have some way to communicate to the people that there are so many services they can engage in? Many times people are not able to imagine and visualize, oh, I can do this and I can do that. Today, when people say service, it means, you know, some kind of a professional service or uh, some of those uh, services. But if we can have a kind of a list of services which people can relate to, you know, I, for example, as we are talking uh, at one point of time, that ex external services for house cleaning and otherwise was not uh, a common thing in India. Now it is slowly coming up. Shoe polish change, change for example. So many shoe polish boys are, you know, unorganized. Uh, internationally, we see there are chains, so they are more organized, they are uh, better rewarded. Also, there is some standardization and stuff like that. And so the people, entrepreneurs can create organized uh, activity. And those who are not organized can get an idea that, okay, I can do this. When they look at television, as you rightly said, I think that's uh, become a major employment creator. Is that, oh, yes, can sing, I can go and sing, you know. Somebody else can dance, I can dance, you know. And that really created more employment. And uh, one great advantage India has is that because at least we have some freedom of speech and expression uh, as a democratic country. So we are able to express ourselves a little more. So creativity, there is more playground for creativity and we can do a lot of things around that. Second thing is that perhaps when this um, uh, tsunami of uh, what you call robotics and automation will come, as they say, there'll be further reduction or that is, uh, you know, that is what is being thought about, is that there will be little laying off the people and um, AI put a, again to the same thing and new types of opportunities will come, no doubt about it. But in the interim, how do you handle those? So we should find some models. A lot of people and industry has even forgotten what is collective bargaining. At one point of time, I remember in 1960s, 70s, you know, we used to see labor unions and others how to discuss. Now, people do not know what is collective bargaining where there have not been many strikes. But um, before all those things happen, we should try to see that, can we find some models? For example, Infosys or some TCAS, somebody lay, they lay up 20, 30, 40,000 people, okay? Or some other organization lays up. What would, how would the growth happen? What would happen? So in those cases, one of the suggestions we have uh, is that, can we create a one third model? That means suppose a company lays out 20, 30,000 people because of use of technology. That means, and, and the new mantra is that, okay, there'll be jobless growth. So there'll be growth of the company, but jobless. So where would people go? So I think we can train people and maximum need for, um, for the activity or jobs will be in social sector. And I would include professional services like medical and other ones as well. Uh, so when they go and work for NGOs, they don't have professional people. So company like, for example, XYZ, they lay out 20, 30,000 people. They should pay one third of the salary to the employee who leaves. One third can be paid by the NGO and one third heat is taken by individual. And one can take one third and go on Himalaya and do whatever activity they want. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this is just one of the thoughts, but we can create some new new models to guide the industry 
that in case if you have to lay, uh, you know lay off a lot many more people by the time new kind of jobs are created and the transitional period you know uh, does not result in any kind of unrest so this is the way perhaps we can look at one or two or three model but our model is one third one third one third third thing is that if is there some way to communicate to people that oh, these are the kind of services you can engage in and based part of our service sector it is least regulated by and large so you know governmental intervention is list capital requirement is uh, almost nil it is just creating and imagining what you can do for somebody and where somebody can find a value so those are the kind of things we can look at i believe india is already about 60 70% services sector and we will be definitely be able to find lot of services that we have never imagined you talked about it a bit and um, next few years will unfold uh, many opportunities uh main thing is as you rightly said to strategize and strategy is all about choices so if we can you know uh give choices to the people that these are the kind of choices that you have you can do this x y z uh maybe people will find their own way to um get into the, the services they don't have to depend on any particular employer per se in that sense of the word and um to some extent it may solve the problem of course there is no 100% solution to everything but this would we have a great opportunity services in our culture and um, uh, i thought i'll uh, you know sound out some of this uh, uh, you know thoughts uh, but uh, i would also like now like to take some comments and uh, questions so may i request uh, my colleague gauri she leads our uh, tmt practice and um, is a top notch uh, technology lawyer and ip lawyer so she has some thoughts uh, and she can uh, may, may I request gauri can you sure so this? can you hear me yeah yeah it was really very enriching you know experience to hear both of you and the biggest takeaway for me were, were two one is uh, you know differentiate between livelihood and jobs because that mindset of i need a job for livelihood need not necessarily be a you know a uh, a combination and the second one which i always thought was respect for each and every job every morning if one garbage person comes to us, our house to collect garbage he has so much pride on his face that i'm doing this job right the point mr prabhu made about you know agriculture not having that much social respect or otherwise but that message is extremely important that each job will have equal respect i think that is another take away for me uh, you know from from what you said now coming to the specifics uh, in terms of what we are facing now and uh, you know uh, uh, what we are seeing around uh, another important issue what was mentioned about whether there will be job losses because of the deployment of technology other than what nishit bhai said about one third it's a brilliant concept there are other concepts such as you know unemployment insurance etc social security and all of that i know india will take some time to reach there uh, but i think uh, uh, coming to the uh, uh, coming to one you know one comment that professor yunus had made in one of our conferences it is ultimately for us to decide where to deploy technology and where not to deploy technology right so uh, basically if you are believing that yes this will be job loss can we do something else about it and you know not necessarily deploy that technology if otherwise you know it is not causing uh, you know causing uh, you know uh, uh, the loss on the productivity coming now to the specific issues on the digital sector because what i believe what will happen after covid is the digital space as we can all see uh, that is going to grow tremendously and in the indian context uh, you know things like i i saw a couple of comments in the chat box also you know cyber security uh issues relating to data protection and all these are going to become you know very very important so from a skill development perspective i believe that is one area that will have to develop tremendously but other than that just the digital penetration because of which people will be able to connect with each other seamlessly and deliver services online including you know some of the initiatives that the government has taken connecting the farmers to the market and all of that needs a very seamless uh, you know digital movement somewhere i feel that you know currently whatever we are noticing in various initiatives that the government has taken which are absolutely great 
but when it comes to the actual you know some of the regulatory hurdles that we are noticing maybe there has to be some more thought you know that is required because sometimes you know it appears to be a small change maybe by the reserve bank of india on the payment side or by the finance ministry on the tax side but unfortunately it creates uncertainties for the digital players and that causes a quite a bit of hurdle uh, you know to come to the grips to handle those situations so somewhere i feel digital space to grow in a very seamless manner it is important to look at all these things very holistically before one or two departments take you know uh, you know independent sort of a view or an approach as to how it is likely to affect the entire community uh, overall so i believe that is if we try to sort of give that kind of a you know more thought process i believe we have you know a lot of opportunities to grow the digital space overall and i'm sure there are other comments that will come in probably from uh, you know media sector that you mentioned but i thought this is one area where we can do somewhat you know more thought a uh, uh, thoughtful approach uh, for the digital space because that is one area which we will see will see a tremendous growth yeah nishit bhai over to you you know gauri oh, yeah would you like to have any comment uh, because she made some very interesting you know first your last point uh, very important about the regulation in fact uh, in my 10 different cabinet positions in the last 20 22 years in the government i always seen the major issue we need regulation but it should not be counterproductive like in case of power sector when the power minister introduced a new law electricity act we changed the power sector completely we created regulator for each state but that regulator was necessary because without that the tariff would not be fixed if you don't fix tariff nobody is going to make investment but you are absolutely right that regulation must understand the business first now the regulation that we have is probably lagging behind few decades and the technology is not just moving but galloping fast at a speed which the regulators are not able to comprehend which is absolutely right what i did was as a commerce industry when i was looking at startups i used to put regulators on one side and the startup community on the other and i should tell them please understand the startup business first what is the point of my telling because what is startup he start to make break from the past and i am a regulation based on the past that the startup is working on future and therefore my regulation is far far behind and i am trying to work on creating a structure which is behind so i have take your point completely the second point you made about the technology and the choice of deployment because you said if you don't want to deploy do not deploy it actually doesn't happen i mean gauri you are better informed than me technology is not something which you can do, close our doors to i cannot say i can close my door and therefore the outside air will not come inside it is not possible technology will be all pervasive if for example even if i say i don't want to listen to nishit i can he can force me to listen by putting something on my this then same thing i cannot or nobody can say that i to, for example this is by cannot will be prevented from going into public space to give a speech but he can still do that with me so what it means is that technology is something which will be in a way all pervasive as well as inclusive so therefore we should not say that technology what is a therefore now the better option rather than saying i will not deploy technology to prevent it from causing loss job losses let us therefore this is the innovative idea and for that the technologies like you policy makers the ideas the lawyers like nishit bhai all of them must come together and say okay this is going to come anyway let us accept that as the reality how do you now cope with this by reducing its ill effect and maximizing its benefit and if i can work like that as i said all technology applied uses for example the payment digital payment so fintech technology in fintech you can see that the fintech technology developer may be reducing or displacing some job but when you use fintech for applied uses probably it can create multiple jobs so therefore how do you therefore go beyond a stage of development of technology and the deployment and is limited application therefore job losses can you therefore look into the entire ecosystem that will be created because of technology so i think that is 
no i completely agree it is one of the thought processes may not may or may not be adopted but that that is one thought process i had heard recently and i was quite uh, taken uh, you know back with the thought process itself i think nishit bhai is doing the right thing he is trying to bring all of us together and as he said correctly not just raising issues but finding solutions i think nishit bhai we need not just wait for the covid to be over or not just think about a scenario that what happens post covid i think this is a completely uh, different world as i said pre industrial revolution to post industrial revolution it is pre covid and post covid world so i think we should think about it in a different way yeah absolutely i think what we can do during the covid and after both are important and i think the future is always there is something interesting to do you know and uh, i'm sure uh, we'll take forward uh, there are a lot of questions and a lot of interest in this session so i uh, may I request uh, ruchir singh he leads our uh, you know private equity real estate um, space and then he has some uh, comments and questions so can you quickly talk about it ruchir yeah thank you thank you nishad bhai and thank you mr prabhu i think um you know thank you for such a refreshing and uh, optimistic perspective i think somewhere when you read all these numbers coming from moody's and ikra saying growth Uh, will be around 2 2.5% world bank says 1.5 to 2.5% i think it can get a bit disappointing but i think clearly uh, you know irrespective of the numbers i think the growth will this time probably be real growth because i think it will be based on more on the formal economy uh, considering the informal economy will be contracting i think clearly sir uh, and you have been very close to the infrastructure sector and i think uh, and i think uh, infrastructure will probably be the way we look at it uh, the driver for a lot of the services as you were saying you know uh, services will be driven but they will be driven at the back of an underlying uh, you know infrastructure setup so i think purely so from an infrastructure set, and and the infrastructure uh, may not just be roads railways airports and bridges but also digital infrastructure in terms of fiber uh, uh, networks and um, uh, telecom towers and we are already seeing you know massive 5 billion 7 billion dollar kind of transactions uh, happening in the market but so uh, and, and and we represent a lot of uh, you know of foreign funds etc investing into the into the sector i was just wondering because infra will be one of the largest sectors which can generate significant employment and these the bigger challenge is that you know there are inordinate uh, delays and lot of operational issues some time back there was a proposal that the dpiit was thinking of uh, giving relationship managers to every large foreign investor which was looking at investing you know 500 million dollars or more i was thinking are there and we can of course discuss in sector specific things later but is there any uh, can we look at uh you know certain employment generating sectors and how can we create a nodal body so to say whether it is in the form of dpiit or strengthening invest india concept or any other nodal body within a ministry which can help streamline these operational issues you know for every time uh, you know an approval can take 8 9 months and uh, we we have suffered a lot because of that so i just wanted to check if there's a macro game plan or a playbook that the government could consider uh, or we uh, you know could think at a policy level so i agree with you uh, the biggest employment generator would be infrastructure itself as the railway minister had prepared the road map for 145 billion dollars of capex which created so many jobs incredible number of jobs and the point that you are making is also valid point that implementation becomes an issue There are state government, there are federal government, and there are within the government there are so many departments. So therefore, there is need to be a nodal body, which point is well taken. Only thing is that the prime minister, in fact, is does something like this, where he has this program in which he reviews all the major projects and try to work on it. But your point is very well taken because we need infrastructure not just for job creation alone. That's a in a way a side benefit, but for even carrying out a normal economic activity. therefore this is a very good point and uh, well taken i think we need to think about the nodal body which is a good point yeah. this is my so, only problem i yeah. have to go for some other program so i can take one right. question so therefore yeah, okay fine very good. okay i'm sorry so maybe i can ask uh, huzefa 
he leads our technology and uh, drones practice and he that one in next a whole nature of infrastructure may also change instead of roads and other thing we might even be thinking of flying cars in next five years it will be reality 10 years time it will be common mode of transport as well maybe uh, Josefa, can you be a little quick uh, absolutely uh, uh, mr prabhu has to leave no no uh, but... I, I, I carry on, you carry on your question. I'll answer it and then go, please. Thank, thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Prabhu. There are questions which have come, but we'll see that. Okay, no problem. So, so I'll probably take a pick on a lot of the panelists and attendees have spoken on IoT, drones, and data and all of that. So, you know, sir, embracing your point, it is not the technology which disrupts jobs or something. It is actually much larger. You need to look at the ecosystem, that where it is actually going to be applied. Like taking your example of agriculture. Uh, you know, though the GDP output of it may not contribute as opposed to, you know, as much as a service sector, but how can we improve that? Uh, disaster management recovery is another thing, you know, crisis times in COVID, so what more and what better can we do? So actually, we've been doing a lot of work and, you know, basis the feedback we've been receiving is how can, you know, drones, AI, big data, IoT, all that actually boost the overall environment not only from a GDP perspective, but even from a, a employment perspective and more importantly, from a disaster management recovery perspective. Now, you know, we all know that, you know, you know, during your tenure as the Minister of Civil Aviation, uh, the rules in relation to drones actually came out. It was the first time it was being made legal, but it was, you know, it has certain limitations that has to fly vis-a-vis -vis the line of sight. Now in situations such as these and going forward, I think people are now open to embracing technology. And if we can talk about drones, AI, and IoT, what more can we do to have a regulatory framework which will actually boost the sector? Uh, you know, uh, I'll probably just take a minute and conclude and then over to you. Uh, currently, you know, in times such as these and moving forward, like say for agriculture sector, right? There are so many use cases which we can have. Soil and field analysis, seed planting, crop spaying, spot, Spraying, crop mapping, uh, you know, surveying, all these, uh, you know, functionalities are there. Drone deliveries for emergencies, whether it's healthcare, surveillancing, uh, spraying, disinfectants. Now, all of that is a possibility, but somewhere, as you also mentioned, that the regulatory framework doesn't enable it. I know that we are not there, but we are taking steps forward. Probably this is the right time to kind of, you know, implement POCs and have the receptiveness of uh, the people of India because they will probably realize the value of, uh, you know, uh, these newer technologies more and more. And uh, over to you, sir, you know, for uh, comments specifically on the regulatory framework and paving the path for some of these technologies. Now, Zofa, I really appreciate your point. In fact, I fully agree with you that technologies, as I, as I was telling Gauri, that you cannot prevent a technology from coming in anywhere. So we should not be wasting our energy, time, or even thinking about how to prevent it, rather than to use it more effectively, more productively, and more attuned to what India needs and try to work on it in a bigger way. You give an example of agriculture, and all these technologies, and particularly AI, you very correctly said. Just imagine we are only 4% of the fresh water of the world, and 17% of the population. 86% or maybe 89% of the water goes into agriculture. So people don't realize when we say agriculture, if water, we said while shaving, we should close the tap so that we'll save water, which is true. We have to do it definitely. But the more water that is used is into agriculture. So unless we make agriculture more efficient in terms of usage of inputs and particularly water, how is it going to do? If you have artificial intelligence, you can work on models. When a crop will get up the, 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 wherever you want to give water, the watering will happen in such a manner that we will not waste it. You will have taken into account the geomorphology of the land. And therefore, we will decide how much water will be actually not counterproductive to the land itself. Because if the salinity increases in land, it actually damages the long term fertility of the land. And therefore, the possibility of future crop uh, giving ability of the land. So therefore, we can work on all the issues correctly. As you mentioned, one more point, probably more appropriate even today's world because we are discussing and we can talk to each other only because of this reason is COVID, is the use of all these technologies for dispensing medical benefits. The service of medicine will can happen with only these technologies. You can fine tune it now. It is already happening that you can do laser-based 
non invasive um, surgeries all this is happening because of technology so you should not prevent it but you should use it in a more efficient manner and there and you have put it really the right point again and hammering it again is the use of the, the role of regulation into development of new technologies because you cannot everything new cannot be measured in terms of old yardsticks therefore if i am using my old yardstick to understand what you are talking about it is no use it is like if my son keeps telling me that dad you are still talking to me as if i am 5 years old so that of course is a problem you can never then i'll not able to relate to him at all because if i forget the fact that he is now more enlightened than me better educated than me so if i have to understand that so regulator also has to understand it regulator thing i know because i went i went to school there are no artificial intelligence now you have to use your intelligence to understand that artificial intelligence is a new invention therefore has to be understood in a different context so point is well taken you see i was just saying because i you had told me by 3 to 4 that's why i yes, taken some other program but next no. time you call me i will assure you we can even have longer sessions no no thank you very much and i really appreciate uh, your coming on board and i know you need to be immediately but um, uh, you know and uh, not only that we must thank you but i think we want you to come again maybe also on some of the other subjects you have so much insight in the whole thing i really want to thank you very very much really appreciate your being with us today you know and uh, just one small thing before you leave you talked about water usage in the uh, agriculture and too much water in fact in our own research campus we have applied uh, iot and iot the sprinklers normally they start at a particular time and stop at particular time here only when the land needs water it identifies dryness in the land only then it sprinkles the water so we can save a lot of water using technology and i this is just one small example i thought i'll share with you and close this uh, i do not want to hold you up but i'll definitely take upon your offer to invite you again and we can get and think let us find more solutions to the problem and uh, thank you so much uh, for readily coming over and appreciate and i was to thank you and congratulate you for bringing such bright minds together on one same common platform so i am little bit embarrassed and overwhelmed by the fact that such bright people are asking me question i think i should learn from you rather than giving you answers so i'm oh. to you and looking forward to working with all of you i think uh, the future belongs to the young guys and really hope that you'll be able to do better and will be able to guide us Thank you, Nishit Bhai, once again for giving. Sure, sure, sure. No. Sorry, many of the questions couldn't be taken, but uh, thank you, Mr. Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nishit Bhai, and thank you, Mr. Prabhu. In fact, uh, thank you to all our participants who have joined in. Uh, just a reminder: we have another session at 6 p.m. for all those who wish to join in on how to set up platforms to deliver grants. and micro credits to those impacted by covid most welcome for all interested participants we look forward to having thank you so so much mm -hmm.